the film that I've chosen that uh, affected me very much, the, not only the entire film, but one particular scene was The Best Years of Our Lives, a William Wyler picture made in 1946. Uh, it's a, a film about American soldiers coming home to their families. And the particular sequence with uh, Frederick March coming back to his home uh, is one of the most impressive scenes, most moving scenes that I've ever seen in my life. William Wyler did uh, several things that made that scene work so beautifully. Uh, and it, it starts right at the beginning of that sequence where uh, Frederick March arrives. And uh, he did a very interesting thing there, which most people would not notice, perhaps a director would. Frederick March goes to the front door of his house and rings the bell. He's completely unexpected. No one knows that he's coming home. He rings the bell and he waits for the door it opened. And he waits a long time. Now normally in a scene like that, you have a certain tempo. You don't want to keep an actor standing out doing nothing uh, in front of a door. And usually the door is answered in films pretty promptly. This is not. Actually, what uh, Weiler is doing is setting up the reality of the scene. You feel that you are waiting in front of this door then you begin to build up this feeling of uh, what's the reaction going to be. They answer the door, and he puts his finger to his lips to indicate that they should not give away his arrival. And he walks through the entranceway, and there's a long passageway behind him, a hallway. And at the end of that hallway is Myrna Loy, his wife, who is in the kitchen, and her back is to the door. And suddenly, you see Myrna Loy feel his presence, and she turns around. And that is a wipeout scene for me. It just killed me. And it still does. Even talking about it, uh, it moves me. The, uh, the setup of the scene is also very interesting because it's such a, a, a balanced composition. You've got the, uh, the two children on either side of the screen and March with his back to the camera and Myrna Loy at the far end of this, like a telescope practically, but they're in the center of the picture. Normally one would avoid that kind of composition, but I think he was uh, giving us a sense of balance at that point that things were right in this house. First of all, to do that, you need a, a wide angle lens so that you could keep the two children in the shot. And when you have a wide angle lens, you have much greater depth of focus, which means that the foreground will be in sharp focus and the background will be in sharp focus. In this case, you want to keep your Frederick March figure, Sharp, who is in the foreground because he is the, uh, a central character, but you also have to see clearly the reaction of Myrna Loy in the distance. And, and uh, Weiler did not cut into a close-up or medium shot of her reacting. He kept it in the long shot, and it's tremendously telling that he did. It was a, a good trick to use that helps the, tell and give the emotion to the scene. That's a proper use of lenses and lighting. And I never forgot the scene uh, and always wanted to steal it. And I eventually had the opportunity to do so. And I used it in uh, a film that I made called The Jazz Singer. And you have the same scene with the same emotion. It works. It worked every time. It worked, worked for me. I think it works beautifully in the picture and uh, I owe a great debt to William Wyler.
I've chosen a film starring Norman Wisdom uh, called Up in the World. And in this particular scene, he's, uh, he's in prison where he's, he's being held for a crime he didn't commit. But, and everybody thinks he's a real big time criminal. And uh, he escapes quite by accident when he's sent up the ladder to clean some windows. And uh, the following sequence is a, I think it's a beautifully written piece of comedy full of sight gags, a particular string of three sight gags which are very cleverly put together. I think it's the unlikeliness of the coincidences which happen. Norman uh, is up the ladder in, in a very high wind um, and the wind eventually causes him to go swinging over the prison wall. There just happens to be a, a truck that's full of straw going past and he falls into the truck and then he's a prisoner on the run. He eventually finds an old pig's die and uh, falls with his, uh, with his head into the, uh, the pig's feed bowl, which is kind of colander type thing. And uh, while he's trying to uh, avoid being seen by the soldiers, he stumbles across a ladder and uh, he, he just happens to finish up with a piece of this ladder in his hands, which is just the shape of a, a machine gun. And then he trips again and, and falls with his head in a bush and, and comes out with these branches stuck to his hat. And uh, the next thing we know, he, he looks exactly like one of the soldiers. And, and, and in terms of the gags, there's, I, I would lo very much liken them to Tex Avery or, or any of the, you know, the classic cartoons of the 30s and 40s. It's a bit like, uh, you know, in Tom and Jerry, where one of them puts a, a rubber glove on his head and he's suddenly a chicken. Or, you know, it's the fact that you can dress as something and suddenly everybody in that world is stupid enough to believe that that's what you are. Stump fella, here first, eh? This will get you promotion. It's like that Ealing comedy kind of world where it's, you know, 1950s Britain. All the edges are slightly taken off and they're usually full of snobs and very stuck-up pretentious people and he he always enters their world just being himself in fact they, his, his name is always Norman in the films he's not playing anybody else and and he always somehow brings them around to a more kind of sense of real human values just by his stupidity he's a very visual comedian a clown really and there weren't many comedians that made that transfer into films very successfully because they were, I suppose they were very much uh, word-based and, and uh, he's completely visual. And he never does one thing without a visual gag or a, doing it in a ridiculous way. I mean, he's, he's annoying in the way that he does it, but he's just so skilled and, and, and you sympathise with him and, you know, the, with his uh, stupidity. I was brought up with normal wisdom films. They, they were always on on bank holidays and uh, I always remember them from them. And I don't consciously take gags from from films such as these, but I think because they made up such a, you know, they had a, such a high input into my own childhood, I think there must be an influence there, because I've always gone for the very visual, and, and uh, you know, that's what he was particularly good at, and I think it must have gone in somewhere. <laughs> You're right, sir. He is making for Vanderbilt. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my God. 